Behavioral interviews can make or break your offer, and if you've got only 20 minutes to prep, this video is exactly what you need. In one of my mock interviews, I was helping this guy to prepare for a Facebook behavioral round. He was doing really well, confident, clear, solid stories. Then I asked, why do you want to join Meta? He smiled and gave me a rehearsed sounding answer. I want to join Meta because I really believe in your values like move fast and be open. I believe that by embracing these principles, I can contribute meaningfully to Meta's mission of bringing the world closer together. On paper, that answer sounds great, right? But here's the thing, he had just googled Meta's corporate values and built his answer around them. And that's where I had to stop him. That question isn't about repeating what's on the company's website. It's about you, your career goals, your motivations, and why Meta actually makes sense for for you as your next step. I told him that authenticity beats memorized corporate jargon every single time. This story highlights the importance of preparation for the behavioral interview. So in this video, we'll address the high-level goals of this type of interview, what the process looks like, the six key signals that interviewers are looking for, step-by-step -step preparation plan, and tips for succeeding at top tech companies. The first thing that I want to share is that this type of interview might be called differently. Leadership, culture feed, communication and collaboration, or just a behavioral interview. Some companies have their own odd names. For example, at Google, it's called Kugliness and Leadership Interview. Even though the names differ, the interview evaluates the same thing. Companies want to know, will this person be able to work at effectively and successfully in the company's environment? Will they come in and do good work and help others succeed too? How to actually assess this? Interviewers are asking you questions about you, your work, your past projects, and looking for specific skills and qualities such as strong collaboration, initiative, effective communication, enthusiasm, and resilience. I'll cover all these key signals later in the video. But to give you an example, for collaboration, they might ask something like, can you give me an example of a time when you had to rely on others to get something done? They want to see if you were a team player, not just a solo hero. Another thing that they are evaluating is the company's culture fit. And this part differs a lot depending on the place where you're applying to, because the cultures are different. For example, at Meta, they would be looking for things like working in an ambiguous environment, ability to move fast and make bold decisions and take ownership without even a clear direction. And this culture and value alignment is not only important for them, but also for you. As Ray Dalio wrote in his book on work principles, you have to work in the culture that suits you. That's fundamental to your happiness and to your effectiveness. All right, let's talk about what the interview process looks like. Usually it's a 45 meeting with someone senior from the company, a manager or a senior level engineer who spent a significant amount of time in the company and well understands its culture. There would be discussion about you, your past experiences, projects, hard problems or situations that you've encountered. The interviewer would be asking questions and you're expected to answer with the stories from your past experiences. There are no right or wrong answers here, but there are effective answers that demonstrate the signals that we'll cover. You should also expect follow-up questions, and this is a really important part. For example, if you're answering a question about a disagreement with a colleague, after you finish your story, you can expect additional questions, such as, why do you think that person had that particular view? What are the pros and cons? What will you do differently now? And what have you learned from this situation? Interviewers are usually asking follow-up questions for two reasons. First, get an authentic, real answer from you, not a rehearsed story. And second, to dig deeper and uncover specific signals that they are looking for. And at the end of the interview, you'll have some time to ask the interviewer your questions. And here it would be a great idea to prepare them beforehand. Ask questions that reveal team culture. For example, how does your team handle disagreements? This also signals your values. 
Okay, let's now talk about the key signals and focus areas that big tech companies are looking for. I'll cover the most popular ones, but keep in mind that there might be some more. The first thing they'll do is they will be checksumming your history based on your resume. You need to know everything that is listed on your CD and be ready to talk about it in detail. If your resume contains something that will catch interviewers' attention, they will definitely ask you about it. For example, if you spent last 15 years working at a company without any role change or responsibility change, they may ask you about it. Or the opposite example, if you jumped really fast into management by switching companies, they may ask you about it, how it happened and why. If your resume contains gaps or jumps, prepare a concise positive narrative that explains them without sounding defensive. Reviewing your CV isn't a standalone quality they assess, but it's a signal they check throughout the interview. All right, the first quality that is usually evaluated is leadership. It depends on your level, but generally it is about taking initiative, being proactive, and leading others. They might assess whether you can take the first step on a problem, breaking it down into manageable pieces, identifying what needs to be done, and finding the right balance between planning and just getting started, even when some details are still unclear. They also look at how you influence others, not just giving directions, but also getting people on board, helping unblock teammates and aligning people toward a shared goal. You don't need to have manager in your title to show leadership. Stepping up in a tough moment, mentoring someone or driving a project forward can all demonstrate it. An example question here might be something like, tell me about a time when you had to lead a project without having a formal position. Next assessed quality is the ability to collaborate effectively, or in other words, would this person get along well with others? It consists of many things, like prioritizing team goals over personal credit, not just working in isolation, being open and transparent with your teammates, actively communicating your ideas, and listening as actively. Empathy is key here. Showing you understood others' perspectives strengthens your stories. It's important to know that collaboration style may differ from company to company. For example, in one company, it's extremely important to write good documentation and write a design doc for every code change upfront. This could be a part of the culture. But in other company, you can have zero documentation and all critical communication would be happening person to person in the office, and people will be holding knowledge. A big part of collaboration evaluation is the conflict resolution. You should definitely expect at least one question about how you resolved conflicts in the past. For example, in a disagreement with a colleague, some people would close, ignore the problem, and build hatred toward that person and the company, which is a red flag. Others would assess if this disagreement is a critical decision for a company's business. If it is, they would raise a question for further discussion. They would have an open conversation, try to understand other people's viewpoints, and find a common ground to build agreement based on data and facts. They would also manage their emotions during conflict, which is an extremely difficult thing to do, at least for me. Okay, example question here. Tell me about a time you disagreed with a technical decision. How did you handle it? The next quality is communication ability. It matters a ton, even for a heads-down coder. You can be the smartest engineer in the room, but if you can't explain your ideas or leave your team guessing what are you doing, it is a problem. Companies don't just hire people to code in isolation. They hire people who can collaborate, align, unblock others, and make the team better. Strong communication means you can break down complex ideas, ask good questions, and share progress with the people above, and give feedback without sounding like a jerk. It also means you're not afraid to speak up when something's unclear or when a project is heading in the wrong direction. It's especially important when working cross-functionally with product managers, designers, and other teams. If you can't communicate well, things get messy and work slows down. In interviews, they're watching how you explain your thought process and how you react to feedback. An example question here is, 
give me an example of how you had to adapt your communication style to work with someone. The next quality is passion or motivation, or sometimes it's called growth mindset. Basically, do you actually care about the work or are you just chasing a paycheck? Interviewers want to see what drives you. Are you energized by working toward challenging goals? Do you take ownership of your growth? A passionate person usually shows self-awareness, actively looks for ways to improve, and doesn't just wait for the feedback. They seek it out so they don't miss learning opportunities. They're also open to learning from failures and mistakes, seeing them as opportunities to grow. They also tend to support others too, whether it's mentoring a teammate or sharing knowledge. Passion isn't about being loud. It's about showing real curiosity, commitment to your craft, and desire to keep getting better. An amazing example question here is, um, tell me about something technical that you learned outside of your immediate work responsibilities. They want to see if you're curious and motivated to learn on your own, not just when your manager tells you to. That shows real enthusiasm, which is what companies are looking for. Now let's talk about resilience. Basically, how you respond when things don't go your way. In top tech companies, things move fast, priorities change, and failures happen more often than anyone wants to admit. What they want to know is, can you stay calm under pressure? Can you bounce back after setbacks? Resilience isn't about never failing. It's about how you recovered and adapted. Resilience means more than just handling big failures. It's about perseverance, maintaining your focus, handling stress, and pushing through everyday challenges that come up so you can actually finish what you start. A strong signal is someone who doesn't blame others when things go wrong, but instead reflects, regroups, and comes back with a better plan. A typical interview question here would be, Tell me about a time you experienced a major setback. How did you handle it? Awesome, now let's move on to the behavioral interview preparation plan. I broke it down into four clear steps. The first step is to create a Google Doc and brainstorm. Your goal is to surface any relevant experience you've had. You need to list all of your projects, whether it's work, school, or personal, that can highlight qualities that are assessed on this interview. Leadership collaboration, communication, passion, and resilience. You can take some from your resume, but not only from there. Some will come from your memory. Think of those experiences as short stories that highlight your qualities. But don't write them word for word. Use short bullet lists instead. The second step is to categorize your raw stories by common behavioral topics or interview questions. You can create a table for that and map your stories to interview topics. Here's a list of common topics. Leadership and ownership, challenging projects, mistakes and failures, conflicts, constructive feedback, dealing with ambiguity, motivation, cross-functional collaboration, persuasion, resilience, or overcoming difficulties. The idea is that when you hear an interview question, you can quickly understand what story from your past experience to use. There are thousands of variations of interview questions, but most of them fall into these categories. The third step is to refine your top stories. Identify about six to eight stories of your past experience that show as much signal as possible. The ones that fall into multiple categories and can be reused. You want to focus on these and polish them. But how to actually polish? Create a bullet list for each story for main facts, actions, and outcomes. Please don't write them word for word you need those notes just to organize your thoughts and prep. You can follow the STAR method for structuring your stories. It stands for situation, target, actions, and result. It's just a simple way to organize your story so you don't ramble or skip important context. But don't follow it too literally. Think of it as a guidance, not a script. The goal is to make your answer clear and focused not robotic. You should aim for two to three minutes per story max. 
Start with situation and your task or goal, then the main part, actions that you personally did, and finish with the result. Focus about 70% of your story on actions, which is where the most signal for leadership and collaboration comes from. This way you'll be able to prepare 6 to 8 detailed stories to use in an interview. One additional story that you should prepare is your inter pitch, basically an answer to the question, tell me about yourself. It should be a short intro where you talk about your current role, college, past work experience, optionally hobbies, and what are you looking for, and why this role excites you. Alright, the last step is to practice delivery of your stories and intro pitch. You can do it by yourself, try recording yourself on a video or book a mock interview online. By the way, I offer help with behavioral interviews so you can book a session with me with detailed feedback. The link is down below. Okay, that wraps up the preparation plan. Again, you need to brainstorm and write down stories from your past experiences, categorize them by interview topics, choose top six and refine them, and then practice telling them not reading. Cool, let's move on to the most important tips for the behavioral interview. The first extremely important advice is to be genuine. Don't lie or manipulate facts. You need to present your real self, your strengths and weaknesses based on your experience. Don't fake stories or use scripted stories from the internet. If you use fake stories, it could backfire. An experienced interviewer asks the same questions hundreds of times, so he knows really well what a strong answer, weak answer, fake answer, and a red flag answer looks like. It's so much better to give a weak answer but with strong learning experience than a fake answer from the internet. If you show your weakness and how you overcome it, it will be a strong signal for perseverance and growth mindset. And those are required qualities. Of course, you can slightly tweak your stories and remove noise or clutter from them, but those should be your stories. Another related tip is to talk on the interview and never, ever, ever read stories off the screen. The interviewer will notice every time. The goal is to connect with the interviewer, not sound rehearsed. I had a client who come to me after he failed a behavioral interview. During our video call, I asked him, what project are you most proud of and why? He started talking, but right away I had a feeling his answer was rehearsed. I noticed his eyes moving from left to right in a repetitive way. So I asked, are you reading answers right now? He said, yes. Then I asked, were you reading answers off the screen on the interview as well? And he again said, Yes. So I told him, that's probably why you were rejected. He was surprised. No one ever told him not to read his answers. My advice, always answer from your head, not from your script. If you're struggling to remember details, it's okay to have short bullet points on a piece of paper. You can glance at your notes sometimes. That's totally fine. The next tip is to avoid negativity. Never blame teammates or complain about past companies. You should also avoid being mean, offensive, arrogant or confrontational with the interviewer or in your stories. That is a red flag. Also, don't be too vague in your answers. Give enough details so the interviewer can actually understand what happened and what you did. Mention the team size, the tools you used, what stakes were, and how your work made a difference. Without enough details, your story might sound generic, even if it was impressive. Another tip is to balance highlighting your good qualities and teamwork in your stories. That means show both in the interview. Important note here is that we is a dangerous word in this interview. You can use it to give context, but then quickly move to I. For example, we decided to change the framework, so I took the lead in migrating the backend. It's important to focus on your actions and your behaviors, so please use the word I. It's you getting the job after all, not your team. All right, that wraps up the overview of behavioral interviews. If you want me to make more videos on this topic, drop a comment. If you enjoyed the video, like and subscribe. It really helps me to promote the channel. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.